Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter number 6, beginning with verse 10. There the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Father, thank you so much for the reading of your precious word. And may we glean from it things that we need to hear and learn in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Today I want to title my message, A Question. And the question is simply this. Is there really a battle? Is there really a battle? You know, my friend, as I begin to think about that particular title, there was a time in our society when the population in general had a greater sense of good versus evil. Now the population at large believed God and heaven were good and that Satan and hell were bad. But we're living in a time now where people parade around our country with a sign that says, I want to go to hell. I kind of expect five minutes after they arrive, no, I'll take that back. I kind of expect one minute after they arrive that they'll change their mind. But the sad thing is 
if you change your mind and you're already there, there's no escape. Sad today, but many professing Christians, now listen, have little sense of the conflict in their lives. We go through our day-to-day activities, we attend church on Sunday, and we live our quiet and orderly lives as good citizens. Now, many live without any awareness whatsoever of the great spiritual conflict that's taking place all around them and how that it might impact their personal lives. And that is so sad. Paul, in this particular text, is trying to awaken the church of Ephesus. But he's also trying to awaken the Gordon Avenue Baptist Church. He's also trying to awaken every church that's meeting today in the name of Jesus. Paul is trying to awaken us to the fact that we are in a battle. We're in a battle. And he tells us to be strong. And he tells us to put on the armor of God. Now, that's one of the most important things that you and I can do as children of God is to suit up and put on the whole armor of God. Now, as we begin to to look at some of the passages of Scripture that I've read in your hearing, the first thing that I want you to see in this is that Paul gives to us a word of encouragement. Now, I don't know about you, but there comes times, or there, there is times, rather, in my life that I need a word of encouragement. Uh, encouragement is important. And it's so important that we encourage one another. Now, I've learned that one of the tools in Satan's toolkit is discouragement. And I want you to know that it's very easy for us to be discouraged, and the devil wants to discourage us with one another. This morning I made uh, the statement during prayer time that we're so busy seeing what others don't do, but we never consider what we don't do. Now, if you will, notice with me verse 10 and verse 11 again. The Bible says here, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. One of the most encouraging things that you can have in your life is the strength of the Lord. My friend, we need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You see, sometimes we get so busy seeing how powerful we are in our own might, but we soon find out that we're not too powerful. And then he goes on to say, put on the whole armor of God. That don't mean to pick and choose what pieces of the armor you like. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. Whenever I went through my military training, I did not like to wear what we called in that day the steel pot. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? That helmet that you had to put on your head. I didn't enjoy wearing that thing at all because it weighed a bunch. It was heavy and it kind of pressed down on your neck just a little bit. But you know what I learned? I learned that in the heat of the battle, that thing could save your life. It could save your life. So we don't get to pick and choose what pieces of armor that we put on. Paul says here, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now listen, even soldiers, soldiers who are about to go out to battle, needs to be encouraged, especially when preparing for battle. Paul here gives us two reasons that we need to be encouraged in the midst of spiritual warfare. Now, first of all, he tells us 
that your power is a gift. Look at verse 10. He says in verse number 10, uh, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It is a gift from God to have the power of his might. We're not supposed to be strong in our own strength, but in the strength that comes from the Lord, in the power of his might. Now, friend, listen to me. God doesn't call us into his service without giving us the strength and the resources that we need to be victorious. God wants for us to be victorious in the battle that we face every day. God wants us to have the victory. But the only way to have the victory is to suit up in the whole armor of God and rely upon the power of His might. Amen. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, uh, the Bible says God has not given to us a spirit of fear. Look at your neighbor and say, I ain't scared. Now, it ain't, ain't good grammar, but look at your neighbor and say, I ain't scared. God doesn't want you to be scared. God doesn't want you to have a spirit of fear. Now, the Bible goes on to say in that particular verse of Scripture, God wants you to have a spirit of power, the power of His might. Friend, when we rely upon the power of His might, we are assured to have victory in Jesus. Now, have you ever thought about the power of His might? Think about it for just a moment. You know what the power of His might can do? The power of His might can raise a man from the dead. Can raise a man from the dead. You ever thought about that? Three times Jesus entered the realms of death when he walked this earth. And three times the power of his might caused the people that were dead to get up. Had an undertaker one time to tell me that the last thing that can be done for somebody is to make them look real pretty and put them away nicely that they won't ever hear anybody's voice again. And I looked at him and I said, Sir, I disagree with you. I say, because one day there's going to be a voice that says, Arise, come forth. Just like the Lord said to Lazarus, come forth. If you hadn't said, Lazarus, come forth, every dead body in the world would have just got up right there. Right there. So you see, the power of his might is the same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead. Do you know you've got that power if you're saved by the grace of God living in you? The same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead is living in you. Now, it is this power that gives us the ability to stand firm in the face of the attack of any enemy that will ever come against us. Is the battle for real? Yes. And you will face an enemy. A lot of people think when they get saved by the grace of God, the battle is over. But honey, I got news for you. The battle is just beginning. Listen to what J.C. Ryle said. J.C. Ryle said, It is the Christian's obligation to fight the good fight the true Christian is called to be a soldier and must behave as such from the day of his or her conversion until the day of their death. He is not meant to live a life of religious ease. You see, that's where we are today. We're living the life of what we call religious ease. It's not an easy thing to be a true child of God. Because, friend, you better bet if you're doing anything or you're accomplishing anything for the glory of God that the enemy is going to come against you. But we find ourselves at religious age, ease. I call that spiritual lethargy. We're lethargic. 
we're satisfied. And see if the devil can ever get you to a place of, of being lethargic and satisfied, then you're not fighting the fight of faith anymore. Because he's got you right where he wants you. Now we must never, listen, we must never imagine for a moment that we can sleep and doze our way all the way to heaven. I've told you this story before, and it's the truth. When I was training at Fort McClellan, Alabama, me and another young soldier was placed on guard duty. He was at the other end of the post, and I was on this end of the post, and I looked down where he was supposed to be guarding the post. And I saw him with his arms folded, eyes closed, and head down. And I looked to my left, and I saw our drill sergeant walking toward him. So I left my post and ran over to wake him up before the drill sergeant got there. And I got there about the same time the drill sergeant did. And I guess that feller heard him shuffling his feet to get there. And he said, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> and the drill sergeant looked at him and said, son, do you think I'm stupid? And then he turned around and looked at me and he said, and what are you doing here? You left your post. We had to pay the price for that. Back in those days, we had KP. I peeled so many potatoes. God doesn't want us to sleep, but he wants us to stay alert and ready for the battle because it can happen at any given moment. I said there were two things under point number one. Number two is this. Your perseverance is guaranteed. Look at verse 11. The Bible says, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, Paul tells us here that we'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, the word wiles, it's just not used much in modern English today. And it speaks to organized conduct, uh, uh, plans or strategies or methodologies, uh, especially relating to war. And that's why we need to live in the armor of God. Listen, friends, the devil is planning attacks on all who oppose his work, or he's planning attacks on all who support the work of the living God. And if you're supporting the work of the living God, look out, because there's going to be an attack. He's coming like a roaring lion. To devour you. The devil has wiles, strategies, and plans for every Christian who is living for Christ. He's got a plan for you if you're a child of God. The devil has. Why else would Paul here direct us to put on the whole armor of God? Is the battle for real? Is there really a battle? There must be a battle because Paul tells us that we must put on the whole armor of God. And at least four times in our text verses of Scripture, Paul tells us to stand against the evil one. God wants us to stand against the evil one. Now to stand is a defensive posture. Rather than attack because Christ has already won the battle. Amen. But if we don't stand ground, then we're giving ground to the enemy. Every time we compromise our spiritual standards and we fail to walk in righteousness, then you and I are giving ground to the enemy and that's exactly what the enemy wants us to do. You see, our task is not so much to defeat the enemy because Christ has already defeated him. He defeated the enemy at Calvary. He defeated the enemy when he walked out of the tomb alive and victorious. But our task is to stand firm in any attempts 
that the devil will use to try to destroy our credibility. Do you know that you're an ambassador for Christ? You are a representative. You represent Christ any and everywhere you go. And if the devil can destroy your credibility, then it's a dirty mark on God. It's a dirty mark on the Christian faith. Listen, anything that Satan can do to weaken or destroy your influence for Christ, he's going to do it. But our perseverance, if we are standing in the armor of God, is guaranteed. But outside the armor of God, our credibility can be utterly destroyed. Now the second thing that I want you to see in this is uh, a word of explanation. Look at verse 12. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Paul gives us a word of explanation. Why we should put on the whole armor of God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now a word of explanation is in order. Against whom? Exactly. Against whom are we fighting? Now, listen to me. The common struggle appears to be denied. Paul reminds us we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, listen to me. Who do we usually get upset with? Our loved ones. Another human being, is that right? Paul here defines who we're fighting against. We don't fight against flesh and blood. Now notice what he says. For we wrestle not. I used to love, can I say it like South Georgia folk? I used to love wrestling. I used to like wrestling. I like Dusty Rhodes. Mr. Wrestling number two. I used to like wrestling. I did. I used to, I used to, didn't, I, I, I just wouldn't miss it. I'd listen to it and watch it every, every Saturday. It'd come on television. Boy, I'd watch it. I enjoyed it. Why did Paul choose wrestling? Paul chooses the word wrestle because of the intensity that it calls to mind. Now listen to me. Athletic wrestlers strain every muscle in close combat with their opponents, never able to relax until the match is over. Spiritually speaking, Paul is simply saying we're always going to be in a wrestling match with the devil. If you're a child of God, you're going to always be in a wrestling match with the devil and his evil forces. But yet there are those who deny that that's happening. Friend, the devil is a real devil. And we've got to overcome him. And we do that by wrestling in the Spirit of God. In the latter portion of verse 12, we see the cosmic struggle declared. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, if we don't wrestle with human beings, then we must be wrestling with powers. 
and principalities. Listen to what Dr. David Jones said. He said, the greatest trouble with the world today and with the church today is that they know so little about the devil and his principalities and his powers. That's why I'm trying to preach this and teach this to our church. Much teaching today in our churches concerning holiness and sanctification. And those things are very vital and important in our Christian walk. Be ye holy as I am holy. God wants us to sanctify ourselves, be set apart from the world. But yet and still, it's important that we understand who we're warring against and the powers that he's going to throw out at us. You see, the problem is regarded solely as something that we can find to ourselves. Listen, Satan commands a vast force of fallen angels who work at different levels in authority and responsibility under his leadership. And if you're not careful, one of them may be a sign. Or let me just rephrase that. Friend, one of them will be a sign to you to attack you. You see, the devil's forces are organized. And if you are a Christian and you fail to be organized by putting on the whole armor of God, then guess what? You're in trouble. Deep, deep trouble. You see, when you don't suit up in the whole armor of God, you defeat part of God's strategy for you to be an overcomer. But oh, when you do put it on, Man, you mess up Satan's strategy. You mess him up bad. And that's what God wants us to do, to mess up his strategy. Now, in verses 13 through 18, we find the covering for the battle. We don't have time to get into all of that right now, but we're going to. But notice what it says. Wherefore? Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. What is the evil day? Any time Satan comes against you is an evil day. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. What is the truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Having the breastplate of righteousness. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Taking the shield of faith wherewith you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And he's going to shoot some fiery darts at you. The wicked one is. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer, supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Listen to me. Not only does God provide the power needed and the might needed to stand, but he also covers us with his armor. Now, as we bring this thing to a close today, God himself. Now, get this. You need this. Listen. God himself provides the armor to be our defensive weapon. He provides it, but it is your responsibility to put it on. When I was a baby, my mama dressed me. When I was a little boy, she laid my clothes out on the bed and I began to learn to dress myself. And I began to grow up and make a young man. She even quit laying them out for me. I had to start laying them out and get her, getting them for myself. And she didn't come in and help me put them on. I had to put them on. Now, I'm going to confess to you that we're living in modern times. Somebody needs to teach some of these young people how to put them on. 
<laughs> That's meddling a little bit, but I had to say it. Amen. Amen. But now listen to me. It's our responsibility to put on the armor. Now I'm going to confess to you, sometimes I wasn't very good at putting on some of the clothing that I might have needed to put on. When I first started seeing my little wife, I used to love wearing cowboy boots. I had me a beautiful pair of snake skin boots. Snake skin. I thought they looked good. She didn't think too much of them. I didn't even know how to coordinate my clothing. And I'm going to be very honest with you. I still have trouble from time to time. I'll go in there and I'll say, Honey, does this match? And if she says something like, I'm not saying nothing. I know that I need to go get something different. <laughs> if she says I'm not saying nothing, I need to get something different. But you see, God's laid it all out for us. He's told us exactly what we need to put on. And it's our responsibility to put it on. And you can't leave one piece of it off. Because if you do, then your armor is weakened. And the sad fact is, sometimes we just don't like to put on the whole armor. We like to put on bits and pieces of the armor. I want you to know, and you hear me when I say this, there is a real battle. And unless we suit up and we get ready for the battle, things are going to continue on what we would think would be a downward path. Oh, but if we suit up and stand in the power of his might, victory, victory will come. Now, I want to invite you to come back this evening because I'm going to talk to you about the enemy that we face. I'm going to give you, give you some things about him that you may not know that the Bible says about him. We cannot fight the good fight if we do not know our enemy. That's why I titled this series the importance of knowing your enemy. I want to tell you who we're fighting against. So if you can, you come back this evening and hear just a little bit about the adversary that we're warring against. Stand with me if you will. Father, thank you so much for your word. Now use this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.